I'm Stephen Hicks, and our guest today is Nimish Adhia. Dr. Adhia did his graduate work at the uh, University of Illinois in Chicago, and he's currently a teaching fellow in economics at Beloit College. And he was visiting Rockford College today, uh, speaking in the business and economic ethics course on the theme of India's economic liberalization and Bollywood film. Uh, Dr. Adia, uh, India is one of the great success stories of the last uh, two generations, a remarkable economic turnaround. Uh, what was India's economic predicament for much of the 20th century? So we can uh, have a sense for how dramatic the change has been. Well, the growth rate since independence had been rather slow. It was about 3% a year, and the economy seemed to be stuck at that average growth rate. That 3% of growth rate came to be known as the Hindu rate of growth. Mm. And with population growing at 2% growth rate, the per capita incomes were only growing at 1%. Uh -huh. And that's, that's really slow compared to like 8 or 9% in Korea and other Asian tigers. So the main dilemma was how to pick up this growth rate before before 1991. Okay. Uh, uh, India's independence was in 1947, yes. is that correct? Okay, so for the second half of the century, right, essentially. And then since 90, 1991, there's been a dramatic change around in growth rates. What are those numbers like? Well, there have been about 5 or 6 percent in the 1990s, and in the 2000s, mm. there were about 7 or 8 percent, you know, rates that second only to that of China. You mentioned in 1991 there was a significant amount of uh, liberalization yes. in uh, economic policy. What were some of the main elements uh, that were liberalized, so to speak? The main thing was that the license raj, as it was called, the licensing system under which most private firms had to acquire permission from the government mm -hmm. to change their production plans, that whole licensing system, which economists believed, led to the slow growth. That was mostly done away with, mm -hmm. and businesses were now free to make their decision based on commercial criteria and did not have to take political considerations into account. So that was one. There was also an opening up of the economy to foreign trade. Uh, 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 the tariffs were as high as 300 percent in some oh. cases, like for example, foreign made cars, and they were greatly pared down. In fact, in 1995, India was one of the founding members of WTO, so that was quite an mm. about phase from before. Mm. So, some examples of the, the licensing what kind of things would one uh, have to get licenses for prior to 1991? So, for example, I read an interview by, uh, by one of the founders of India's big. IT firms, uh, Narayan Murthy, and he talked about how when he first started his firm, he had to wait nine months to get a license to import a computer from the United States. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that so would certainly slow uh, growth rates down, right, yeah. dramatically. Yeah. Now, uh, if we start to ask why there was the dramatic shift, certainly people respond to uh, material incentives, and if India is still struggling with poverty issues and seeing in some parts of the world things are going relatively much better. That's an incentive to change uh, or try to change economic policy to, to improve. But part of your argument is that there were significant cultural changes that were also part and parcel of and ideological changes. Uh, what do you mean by an ideological change or what's an example of an ideological change that you think was happening in India? So by ideology, I mean what people believed about uh, how the economy and the world works and yeah. how it should be working, etc. Uh, as you said, it's true that material incentives uh, definitely play a part, but they can hardly be enough. For example, after the fall of Soviet Union, when there was this disillusionment with central planning, not all countries turned away from central planning. Mm. Some countries have always stayed. And even before the Berlin Wall fell, it was obvious that central planning wasn't working. It was obvious for a long time in India itself, yet there was no political, political will to make that change. And I think that a very decisive factor was that people came to find more liberal market policy to be morally legitimate mm -hmm. and to be acceptable. Okay, so by saying that they're more morally legitimate, it's one thing to say that central planning doesn't work and that yeah. private markets are working better. It's another thing uh, uh, to say that private markets with their profit motive and the pursuit of self-interest and comparative advantage and so forth are moral or decent or socially redeemable. 
Yes. Um, well, the central planning was not working. Everybody agreed. But how did they interpret that? Pe a lot of people could have said, well, the central planning wasn't working because we didn't regulate the businessmen enough. We uh. let them get away with a lot of stuff. Okay, so we need to regulate them more. A lot of people were saying that. But then the interpretation that most people took out of it was that you know, it doesn't work and we need to go to a different state of affairs and which is also morally acceptable, so mm. let's go that way. Okay. Now, an interesting part of your, uh, your, your study, uh, as you presented in your talk, is there's the debate that's going on among the intellectuals and the policy policymakers and politicians about uh, liberalization or, or centralized command, but uh, the big part of the cultural change came from, or at least was reflected in Bollywood films. Yes. Uh, that you can track or see the differences in how business and so forth is portrayed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s compared to the 1980s, 90s, and on into the 2000s. Uh, uh, how do you study something like that, uh, cultural change as reflected in Bollywood? What uh, did your research consist of? So I used a method called content analysis. Okay. It's basically making observations about contents of films. And I did it again for newspapers and to quantify certain dimensions of the message that is being conveyed. Yeah. So there are two things that I measured. One is what percentage of heroes in the fi most popular films during a decade were businessmen and how that changed over yeah. time. And I found that in the 50s and the 60s, Hardly any heroes were businessmen. Mm. Well, in the 80s and the 90s, about 80% of the heroes were businessmen. Wow. And to me, that says that people have come to see virtue and commercial success as being as being compatible with each other, mm. not, not ex exclusive. That wasn't the case earlier. In the 50s, inevitably, the businessmen were showing exploiting widows or beating children to get money out of them. Right. There is, you know, there's a movie called Boot Polish, which has that theme in it. Uh, so that 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 stereotype of a businessman has dissolved in the 80s and the 90s. Mm -hmm. So we take the most popular film from each year across yeah. 50 years, and then one thing to or one part of the content analysis to, is to focus on the hero of the film. What percentage of them? Or any quantifiable dimension. Right, our, okay, our, our heroes. You also mentioned uh, that you track just uh, businessmen as they are portrayed, right, in general, yeah. even if they're not the main character. Yeah. And then the results there also was a, was a positive and trend. There is, there is definitely. Okay. There are few, few businessmen in Indian films today, leading heroes. In fact, they're doing good things. For example, they're paying back their debts even at great cost to themselves. Ah. You know, that is, okay. that is, uh, that, that that was not there in the 1950s. Uh, the business fair men were were willing to get away with anything they could get away. All right. With. So it's more more than norm to see businessmen portrayed as uh, men of integrity, yes. men of honor. Uh, who are enriching themselves and also enriching yes. others in the course, so it's yeah. more socially beneficial. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, you also showed us two uh, short film clips, one representative of uh, Bollywood film before and one representative after. The one before, what was that one called and what was its theme? The film was called Opkar, which means obligation. Okay. And the theme was that a good society can be only built by selfless dedication of people. So the hero is the farmer, and he's always exhorting people around him to give up uh, pursuing their own gain and instead work for the common good. So his brother wants to move to the city to make more money, and he says, no, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Who's going to farm? And if we don't farm, then people will go hungry. Well, he doesn't take into account that in the 1950s, economists were trying to get people away from the land because there was so much pressure on the land that made uh, cultivation uneconomically, but mm. those considerations are never shown in the films. In the films, the good results only come about if people dedicate themselves to whatever occupation they have okay. without regard to their own personal gain. All right, so the idea was that despite uh, the economic analysis, yes. uh, the moral message and the ideological message was trumping. Yes. And that was holding India back. <laughs> लोगों की अमानत है और लोगों तक पहुंचनी चाहिए समझे भारत भैया मुझे माफ कर दो पुरन हमारे देश में पहले ही अनाज की कमी है 
बाहर के देशों से अनाज आता है ये बहुत बड़ा एहसान है उनका मगर हम पे ये कितना बड़ा कलंक है कि किसानों के देश में अनाज की कमी है मगर क्यों? इसके जिम्मेदार कौन है वो किसान जिन्हें खेतों से ज्यादा शहर पसंद है पालने निकला तो कोई पेट में पलने लगता है महंगाई बढ़ाने वालों से ये भूखे फरिश्ते पूछते हैं जब भी देश की बात होती है ऐसे लोग मजाक में उड़ा देते हैं ये लोग जो पीते हैं वो शराब नहीं अनगिनत लोगों का खून है द कॉन्ट्रास्ट फिल्म यू शोड वाज फ्रॉम आई बिलीव 2006 uh, गुरु यस एंड व्हाट वाज द द मेन थीम ऑफ गुरु एंड पर्टिकुलरली द क्लिप यू शोड अस गुरु हैज ऑलमोस्ट अ रांडियन थीम टू इट द हीरो इज वेरी रांडियन ही इज अ सक्सेसफुल बिजनेसमैन एंड ही इज बीइंग परसिक्यूटेड बाय पीपल हु डोंट लाइक हिम फॉर वेरियस रीजंस एंड ही इज वेरी अनअपोलॉजेटिक अबाउट हिज कमर्शियल सक्सेस and he's being valorized in the film mm-hmm. uh, he triumphs in the end against those bad guys who who say that you become rich by doing bad things by exploiting people and uh, he in the in the end he has a say in the court and that has been portrayed as something that is very heroic and they show people clapping and people clamoring to be with him okay खोड़ा हो जाओ या इसके लिए भी लाइसेंस चाहिए आपने इल्जाम लगाया ना मेरे ऊपर ये एक्साइज कस्टम इनकम टैक्स ये टैक्स वो टैक्स अगर पैसा बन सकता था तो मैंने बनाया है लेकिन सिर्फ अपने लिए नहीं अपने तीस लाख शेयर होल्डर के लिए नहीं क्यों ना बदली किस बात हमारी हमारे और हमारे देश की आप चाहते हैं कि मैं हमेशा पेट्रोल पंप अटेंडेंट रहूं और हमारा देश हमेशा हाथ पलाई घूमते हैं क्यों ना हम ऊपर तक पहुंच सकते हैं हमें तीसरी दुनिया क्यों बुलाया जाता है हमें भी उतना यहां के पहली दुनिया बनने का और हम बन सकते हैं आपने मुझे पांच मिनट दिया था ना साढ़े चार मिनट में सब कुछ खत्म कर दिया मैंने तीस सेकेंड प्रॉफिट मुनाफा यही होता है बिजनेस आप अगर इसके लिए भी मुझे आप सजा देना चाहें तो दे दीजिए गुरु कांत देसाई सजा से नहीं डरता Just uh, in, in closing, can you uh, give us a sense for where you think India will be over the course of the next generation, as well over a billion people in in population? Uh, do, you, do you see the poverty rates continuing to decline? The number of wealthy people, number of middle class people, continuing to increase? I I certainly think so, and I certainly hope so. Uh, there have been good signs. For example, the reformist uh, Prime Minister of India recently was re-elected, and. Uh, and uh, so that gives us hope that the reforms are going to continue mm. also uh, it has done pretty well in during the recent global financial crisis it has continued its growth rates of 6 and 7% uh, so that those are those are it moves in the right direction okay all oh, it's very promising yes. right, well thanks for being with us today okay thank you